Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Lovely to have you with us and uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we're just um, delighted to be back in the saddle, so to speak. What we call back in carrozza in Italian, back in, uh, back together uh, doing these webinars. So great to have you here. Uh, where should we start? I think the place to start is with the multiple CSIs. And I've got them on three minute, five minute and 15 minute. You've seen this many times before. But what this actually reveals, because it's always the starting point for any analysis to highlight where to go and discover what is going on, potential opportunities, uh, where currency pairs are in congestion, whether they're trending, what is the sentiment in the market. All of that is revealed from this array. And the reason I say that is because if you take the commodity currencies, for example, as a starting point, in other words, down here, the New Zealand in gray, the Canadian and the Aussie. So those three. Now, clearly what's happening at the moment is they are moving pretty much as a group. You've got the same effect over here on five and precisely the same effect over here on 15. So in other words, the commodity currencies are being sold. That in and of itself is enough to give you a view as to sentiment in the market because currency, the commodity currencies are risk. They're risk currencies. That's how they are defined. That's their DNA, if you like. So if they are being universally bought or universally sold, then that is telling you about risk. Now, that view of risk is further confirmed, as Adam mentioned, with regard to the yen. The Japanese yen is the magenta line at the top here. So on three, on five and on 15, we can see we've got strong buying of the Japanese yen. Now, that means that there not only are there nice trades to which have developed over the this shorter term time frame for all those yen commodity pairs. Sorry about that. Someone on the phone. What it also tells us is that it, it's giving us a view on risk, because if all the current commodity currencies are selling off and the Japanese yen is being bought, not only do we have nice trades because we've got divergence on the currency pair, on the currency strength indicator. So we've got one currency which is selling very strongly and one currency, the yen, which is being bought very strongly. So we have great trades. We don't need to, I can tell you without looking at a chart, what that will look like. There will be a very solid trend there. So that it, it's all of this is revealed. You then look, you then start to drill down into well, what am I looking for? Am I looking to jump on an existing trend? Am I looking for a reversal? Now, those of you who come along regularly to these sessions will know that I'm greedy. I like to get into trends early. I don't particularly like jumping on a trend once it's underway because I've already given up a fair proportion of that potential in the trend, whether it's on a a one, three, five combination, or whether I'm looking at it on a slower term time frame, maybe a, an hourly, down even to the daily. I like to get in early. So my eye is always drawn to the tops and bottoms. I'm always looking at the potential overbought up at the top here. In, in, in this case, on the five minute, we can see we've got the yen and the dollar. Down at the bottom here, we've got the Aussie which is heavily oversold. The Canadian has not quite got to that region and the New Zealand dollar is, is a little way off. Now these lines at the bottom here are not, they're not hard and fast um, signals of, oh, well, it's hit that level, so the currency is going to reverse and I'll just jump in and, and happy days, we're off to the races. It's merely a guide at these 80 up the top here and down here at the 20 level to give you an indication of when that currency is potentially overbought or oversold. But it does not automatically imply that that particular currency pair that you've chosen, for example, if you were looking at the Aussie down here and the dollar or even the dollar yen would make no difference. Both of those or that particular currency pair on this particular time frame, certainly down in the fast time frame from one minute upwards, 
is probably reaching an oversold position in terms of the Aussie. If you go out to the 15 minute, the yen is certainly into heavily into overbought, but the Aussie has got a little way to go. So maybe there's a little bit further to go. Now, what it signifies is when you look at it on, if we scoot over to the three minute here, we've passed into oversold for the Aussie, but the Aussie is remaining here. We had a little kick up here, but it's still there. And this is the key point. Currencies will remain there for some considerable time. They may, may, they may remain there for a little while. They may be there for a long time, all things being equal in terms of when I talk about long term on a one minute, that may be for five or 10 minutes they sit there. On an hourly, it could be for several hours. But the principle is that there is no guarantee that that currency will immediately reverse and give you a nice trend in the opposite direction. All you can be assured of in the currency market is that at some point, that currency will reverse because the Forex market per se is a perfect example of mean reversion. And by that, I mean that currencies have to move in this oscillating fashion from top to bottom, back to top, down to bottom. Now, clearly, if they did that at the same price point, then the prices would never change, which is not the case, obviously. It's common sense. But this is a market of mean reversion. It is pure in that sense. And in that sense, you can be assured that at some point that currency has to move. It cannot stay oversold and overbought forever. So it's not a question of if it will move, it's a question of when. And that requires patience. Whatever time frame you're trading, as I say, whether you're scalping or trend or reversal, whatever it is, longer term reversal, it doesn't matter. You've got to be patient. The payoff for that patience is that you have to set wider stop losses because this could go on for a period and you don't know how long that's going to be. And therefore, you have to allow for that buffering of price, that congestion phase, which automatically follows or generally. It's very unusual that you get a currency like this that gets down to the bottom and then immediately reverses and wangs back higher. It happens. Of course, it does. But it's more general the case that you will see the currency move into this congestion phase. And if a currency is in congestion phase or a currency pair is in congestion phase, you have to allow for that buffering. Now, the payoff is you are obviously putting more risk on the table in the sense that you have to set a wider stop loss. So your risk is that much higher. But as with everything in trading, your reward is that much higher because if you've taken that position in the market on the assumption that the currency pair is going to reverse and therefore you're going to get in early and therefore take more profit out of it, that comes at a price and that price is setting your stop loss wider. The payoff is when the trend starts, you're in at the ground floor, if you like. It's as simple as that. If you want to be a trend trader and you don't want to put that extra risk on the table, then that's a decision you make because you are then jumping on a moving train. The analogy I've moved, used many, many times before, it's a moving train. In the reversal where we are at the moment, let's take the Aussie, for example, the Aussie dollar on five or let's take the five minute as a simple example. I'm looking at the five minute uh, CSI and I'm thinking, OK, this is a potential reversal for Aussie dollar. I am sitting on the train waiting at the platform for that particular train to leave. There's no timetable. I don't know when it's going to leave, but I'm pretty sure it is going to leave at some point. Once the train is underway, then the trend has started. You as a trend trader are then jumping on that train. And your payoff or your, your advantage, if you like, is you don't have to put so much risk on the table because the trend is already developed. Your stop loss can be that much tighter. And therefore, uh, the payoff is that you don't get so much reward because the train's left the station. You haven't got the advantage to go on those particular stations. They've already, already been passed by the train. In the same way, you can't recoup any of that profit that's already gone. You just look at it and think, well, that was a nice trend and I missed it, so I'm going to jump in now. That's the, the, those are the decisions you have to take. Now, those decisions will largely be governed by your tolerance to risk, also very much in terms of your how long you've been trading, your your reading of a chart, your technical ability in terms of reading VPA, 
but very much down to risk. Are you happy putting more risk on the table for higher reward, or do you want to take a more conservative approach, in which case you will wait for the trend to develop, you'll wait for the, the train to leave the station, and then you'll jump on a moving train. So I just wanted to make that point. There is so much information here that we can glean purely by looking at the, this indicator in multiple time frames. And like everything in trading, we do it in multiple time frames. And obviously, you're looking at potential trends, but you're also looking at those currency pairs which would not be moving particularly strongly. And for example, nice kick up here on the Aussie CAD. So if I was to look at the Aussie CAD here, and indeed, all the any of the combination in this move lower across the Aussie commodity complex, uh, sorry, across the commodity complex, any combination of these currencies of Aussie, New Zealand, or CAD, they really wouldn't have a trend because they're all pretty much moving in the same direction. So there's no divergence. What we always want to see is very strong divergence. So you want to see one currency which is rising very strongly and one currency which is falling very strongly. Now, very quickly, before I pass back to Anna, let me just hop on to the day trading Forex workspace. This is the one I've got cable on here. And again, I just wanted to make the point, it is very much about multiple time frames. It's a really nice trend we've got going at the moment, but it's, it's not a straightforward trend to trade. And really, the point I wanted to make here is about the volatility indicator, because over here on the 15 minute, we had an initial volatility on, on 15. And what you always have to remember is that the slower time frame, this is going from 15 second up to 15 minute, this workspace. We so said we've got six charts here. What you always have to remember in any aspect of trading is that what happens in a slower time frame, whatever that may be in the context of your trading uh, profile, that will always carry more weight. It will be that much more significant. And that it doesn't matter whether it's a volume related uh, significance, whether it's an indicator related significance, it will always carry more weight. Now, when this uh, candle developed on the 15 minute, it was a very nice trend. But then we had the volatility trigger, which is the little uh, purple dots above and below, which tell us that the price action has moved outside the average true range. And at that point, on the faster time frames, the move came to a shuddering halt. And if you don't have those slower time frames up, giving you all these little pieces, all these little nuggets of information, you would have been left wondering, well, why has it paused? You know, what is going on? Sure, you would have seen obviously VPA coming into effect. You would have had the trend monitor here and everything else. But the key piece of the puzzle was the fact that we had volatility here. We've also got it again here on 15, another volatility trigger. And we also had it very much across the time horizon. We had it on 10. We had another one here on five. And when you see that occurring, the reaction is likely to be within the spread of the candle. So we see volatility. And the, the indicator is very simple in the way it works, but so powerful in what it reveals. It's basically looking at average true range. In other words, what is the expectation of price action on this particular time horizon for this particular instrument at this particular point in the trading session? And what it signifies is that the price has moved outside of that expected range. And when it does that, it's normally a signal for one of two things to happen, either congestion or potential reversal. And it doesn't always have to be a reversal, but congestion is a killer from a trading perspective, because it causes indecision, it causes you to have an emotional response. For example, if you were trading in here, you were in the trend, you think, great, 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 okay, I'm making money here. Then we get a decent hammer candle at the bottom, lots of volume under there. So we know it's going to reverse anyway for a VPA trader. Then we get the reaction higher. But the reaction higher is also giving us another signal, not only in terms of volume. So the volume is falling away as we've got the price rising, which is a classic anomaly because we ought to see price rising and volume rising together. And they're not. They're moving in opposition. So despite the fact we've got some decent buying here, what this is telling us that this move isn't going to go very far. What it also confirms is that within the volatility candle, we were expecting it anyway 
because we've had volatility and therefore at the very least we expect congestion or potentially reversal. But in this case, the reversal does not go very far. It falls away on the volume. So it's just that is VPA in action, giving us a very, very clear signal of what is like to happen next. And this whole move is really punctuated by a series of these. We've got another episode here. We didn't have any volatility. We had very strong buying with the volume coming in there. On this occasion, look at the volume on the third candle here. We've got very high volume, but a very narrow spread candle. What's that telling you? That's anomalous. Why? Because that spread of that candle should be much wider. It isn't. It's narrower. So it's telling us in this case that we've got weakness. And it was actually preceded by this candle with decent volume and certainly some weakness coming in. So it doesn't look particularly strong. Then we get a further repeat. We get another hammer, lots of volume coming in. So we're expecting a reversal at this point. Then we get this widespread up candle on uh, volatility. The volatility triggers. It's a classic sign that, uh, as I say, are we going to get congestion or are we going to get a reversal? Either we don't want to see and on we go. And then the trend monitor kicks in and helps us move on down in the trend. And at this point, this is just bringing the VPOC in, which I've, it's all, the only indicator I've got on this chart under the volatility, I've got the, the VPOC. Once we get down to the volume point of control, when we see it appearing on uh, whatever time frame we're trading, this is on a one minute time frame, so it's pretty quick. But wherever you see that occurring, then you expect to see congestion. Why? Because we've got the heaviest concentration of volume at that particular point. And volume works in exactly the same way on the VPOC as it does with the accumulation distribution indicator in terms of support and resistance. In this case, we're looking at support and resistance from a volume perspective. And with the accumulation distribution indicator, we look at it from a price perspective. But the principles are identical. So when you get very large, significant areas of volume, as you do at the volume point of control, then as you approach it, you expect the price to congest, which it then does. It's now broken away. And equally, when you get down to a low volume node as here, you expect the price to move through there pretty rapidly, which it did, which is always a nice thing to see. So when you see price approaching low volume nodes or high volume nodes, in conjunction, obviously, with price based support and resistance, it's another powerful indicator that we use as a combination because volume is just as descriptive from that sense as price itself, which we're all familiar with. So I'm going to pass back to Anna at that point. And uh, we'll just see how this develops. Just take a quick look at the slower time frames. We've got a little bit of buying coming in now. You can see it across the time frames. You can see the wick to the lower body here, decent volume under there. So expecting a bit of a bounce if we're short. See what's going on on 10. That's pretty OK. Any buying here? Yeah, we've got some buying coming in over on five. Decent wicks to those lower bodies. Good volume under there. So we're expecting to see a bounce. How far is this going to go? Well, to come back to what I was saying just now, We've got a, quite a substantial area of volume here. So if this is going to develop, then we're going to have to see some decent volume developing in order to drive through there. And in addition to that, we've got some sustained volume under this particular candle, a doji. So it's not particularly demonstrable of a very strong trend reversal at the moment. 